We're taking a walk through comics history on the Lower East Side. Here at 147 Essex Street on August 28, 1917, Jacob Kurtzberg was born. The world would know him by a different name, Jack Kirby, the king of comics. It was here where Kirby's boundless imagination and tireless work ethic took shape. During his career, Kirby created countless characters that have become permanent fixtures on the pop culture landscape. Captain America, the Fantastic Four, the X-Men, Thor, the Hulk, Nick Fury, the Eternals, the list is endless. But while his Marvel masterpieces may be his most popular creations, he saved his most ambitious work for the distinguished competition. When Kirby made the jump to DC Comics at the start of the 70s, he created three titles, The New Gods, The Forever People, and Mr. Miracle, to tell a story as big as anything comics had ever seen. And nearly 50 years later, it's as influential as ever. Let's go behind the panel with Jack Kirby's Fourth World. All right, I'm getting a guided tour of Jack Kirby's New York City by Ilana Levin, who's with the Jack Kirby Museum, and you're also the host of the Graphic Policy Radio podcast. That's right. How important was Kirby's youth here in the Lower East Side in terms of the work and the drive that he showed throughout his entire career up until the very end, where he was always looking to work to put food on the table for his family. Jack Kirby's experience growing up in poverty in the Lower East Side was absolutely formative to his work ethic as well as to a lot of stories that he told. These were Lower East Side tenements that were standard of the period and these were places that did not have adequate air, light, plumbing. With so many people living all in one space together. It, it was a very hard way to live. There were exposés in the media to show how desperate the circumstances were. At the end of the 1960s, Jack Kirby and his wife Roz left the only place they'd ever really known, New York City, and moved west. It was primarily to provide a better climate for their daughter Lisa, who had asthma. He brought with him his unmatched creativity and a plan of action that was about to shake up comics. I met Jack Kirby in July of 1969. He had just moved to Southern California, and I did a little work with him for the remainder of that year. And then in February of 1970, he took a friend of mine named Steve Sherman and myself to lunch swore us to secrecy that he was about to leave Marvel Comics and asked us if we, we'd be his assistance when he worked for DC Comics, his new employer. And we sat on that secret for a month and one day Stan Lee got the phone call and Jack called afterwards and said, okay, I'm a free man, I'm working for DC, let's work on the projects. The projects would be three bi-monthly books telling the biggest single story comics to that point had ever seen. The Fourth World, it gained that name after its debut for reasons no one has ever really been able to explain was about a conflict between the gods of the planets New Genesis and Apocalypse. The planets were once the same world, divided by the fall of the old gods. Against this grand cosmic tapestry, comics' greatest myth maker bombarded readers with new characters practically every issue. High Father, the leader of New Genesis, Orion, Mr. Miracle, Light Ray, Metron, the Black Racer, and of course, the ultimate villain, Darkseid. These were just a few of the wild creations that sprang from Kirby's imagination for his fourth world. The seeds of the story were first planted in Kirby's first book for DC, Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. The original plan was for Kirby to launch each title, and then after a few issues, turn them over to other creators, including fellow legend Steve Ditko. But DC nixed that idea and wanted Kirby to handle all the books. So Kirby did what Kirby always did. He went to work. Is it safe to say that for Kirby, his experiences growing up here in the Lower Side at that point in time was hugely instrumental in really creating that work ethic that he was known for because nobody could crank yeah, out pages absolutely. like he could. Absolutely. His work ethic was absolutely shaped by his experience living in poverty in the Lower East Side, without a question. Um, he had an aspiration to, ne to leave the Lower East Side and never come back, which is true. He was able to do that by being a creative genius and working his ass off. Jack's contract with DC called for 15 pages edited, written, and penciled a week. He could do more than that and be paid for more, but his base salary was based on the assumption he would turn in 15 pages a week, which is astronomical by any means. I mean, there are people in the business who struggle to get five done a week. Mike Royer quickly found a place by Kirby's side, not just because he was that rare inker who could actually keep up with his furious penciling pace, but also because he didn't try to reinterpret or embellish Kirby's work. He just inked it and got out of the way. Well, I never wanted to, quote, fix, unquote, or change what Jack did. I wanted to finish it, like I said, in my mind that I thought he would have done it if he'd had the time. And to warm up on each page, well, it was only the first page of three a day, 
I would do backgrounds. And it was just a way of assuring that my line weights for characters and things in the foreground were bolder, so it had a kind of a flat but multiplane look to it. Well, it was difficult for a lot of people to ink Jack's work because they didn't draw as well as Jack, and they often didn't understand his drawing as well as they could. But Jack, Jack worked in very bold strokes, and he had a lot of energy in his work. And one of the problems he faced was that a lot of his inkers, though they might be skilled artists in some way, or very good for other pencilers' work, weren't accustomed to being as bold and, and thick with their lines and, and as direct with them. And they lost a lot of the energy in it, and they lost a lot of the expression in the faces. I was the only guy that ever kept up with Jack. And that's why I don't remember the nuts and bolts of doing it, because I had to ink three pages a day. I would letter a 20 or 22 page book in two days, that's bordering circling balloons, and at least three pages with display lettering. And to this day, I'm still kind of proud of that. At conventions, people, if I have any celebrity, it's because I worked with Jack over a 10 year period. I followed it with 21 and a half years as a Disney character artist, but the fame at these conventions is the connection with Jack. The best work I ever did at Disney was because in my head, Jack is looking over my shoulder saying, do it your way, Mike, and tell a story. Elina, we're here in a spot that obviously is much different than it was when <laughs> Jack Kirby was a child, but this is where he spent a lot of his time? Yes, uh, they lived on, over on Essex briefly, and most of his childhood was spent over here on Suffolk Street, uh, which is now a school, although a lot of the buildings you'll see around us are not dissimilar from what they would have been. But yeah, this was his, essentially his boyhood home. There's amazing stories of what he used to do in the building. His first real exposure to thinking about like visual art in this way was he um, found an issue of a science fiction magazine, like literally in the gutter, picked it up, loved the images on the cover. There's stories of him drawing and his mom letting him draw uh, rocket ships in the hallway on Suffolk Street in the hallway of his building. So that would be quite the mural to walk into. In his book, Kirby King of Comics, Evanier says the move to DC was Kirby's attempt to take control of his own creative destiny. He had big ambitious ideas and not just regarding the story. Now that he was at DC, Jack wanted to do a lot of different things. The fourth world was only one of them. He wanted to do new kinds of comics and new sizes and new shapes. The industry was in a lot of trouble at that time. A lot of people were predicting it wouldn't continue very long. And um, he didn't want to do conventional size comics. He wanted to do bigger comics and fancier comics on better paper. Uh, DC wasn't interested in investing in that at, the point, at that point, so they started some regular size comic books, and that's where he basically invented the fourth world. When Kirby left Marvel for DC, he insisted on creative control. He also would no longer draw and plot a story for another writer to dialogue. That was what had helped spark the rift at Marvel with Stan Lee, and Kirby was tired of seeing others get credit for his creations. The fourth world was pure, unfiltered Kirby magic. When he was working with other writers, they often distorted the meanings of things or changed the intent of scenes, and it's not as evident. But once he was free to be his own editor and his own writer on his books, he let that flourish. He let all the feelings he had flourish about the world and people in it, and he wrote about himself, and he wrote about his relationships. Well, Jack was living in an environment where youth gangs were really predominant, and you know, Fantastic Four, Ben Grimm, who was identified as being one of the most Jack Kirby characters at heart, and he was pretty clearly named after his father. Ben Grimm is always contending with the Yancey Street Boys, who are a gang of miscreants who we never see on uh, in the actual comics. You just sort of see and hear about them tormenting the thing. Yancey Street, Delancey Street, like it's the name is absolutely from that. Um, and he drew. And this was the neighborhood yeah, where the he neighborhood. was running with the gangs. This was, and Jack Jack actually like would get in fistfights with the other gang members, the other youth who were involved in gangs when he was young. He did a comic about that called Street Code later in his life. It was the dominant way of like life for folks in the neighborhood who were his age. You didn't have really good adult supervision. He says that his experience in the fist fights when he was a kid influenced how he actually blocked and staged fight choreography in his work. Um, he said that in one fight he felt like time was slowing down around him and he could see everything. And I think that there's a physicality um, and a believability and I think some of his physical like fist fights that he drew of his characters that you get because he actually had lived that experience as a boy. I could probably translate that to his artwork, which was always known for its power and yep. its impact. There was yep. always an energy to a, to a Kirby page that nobody else could replicate. Yeah, and the foreshortening of having a fist coming at your face is definitely a foreshortening that you would not forget. 
Evanier says Kirby saw a bit of himself in two of the key figures in his fourth world story. The main two characters he identified with were Mr. Miracle and Orion from the New Gods. Orion represented to Jack the fact that sometimes in this world to put food on your table or your children's tables you have to do some ugly things. And a lot of what he wrote about when he was work, working on Orion was feelings of it in the past where he wasn't comfortable with what he had to do or the way he had to subjugate his ideas or philosophies to someone else because Orion had two faces. He had a human face and he had a, a deathless, horrible face and Jack was kind of talking about his own darker side in there. With Mr. Miracle, he was talking about the way he felt throughout his career that he had to escape from something, a company he didn't like, a job situation he didn't like. And it was all about escapes with Jack. And, you know, it was based roughly, Mr. Miracle, on the career of Jim Steranko, who had been an escape artist before he was a comic book artist. But Jack infused it with his own feelings about being confined, about having to break free from things. And then when the character Big Barda came along, she kind of represented Jack's wife, Roz, not so much physically, but in terms of the way she cared about him and the way she took care of him. Kirby Unleashed at his drawing table provided a torrent of memorable images, like the glory boat splash from New God 6, simply one of the all-time great pages in comics. Fans absolutely loved the artwork in the books, and today spend thousands to own Kirby's original artwork. Kirby's bombastic dialogue, however, sparked mixed reaction. Some thought it was clunky and overwrought. Writer Tom King offers his own counterpoint to that argument. There's so much going on. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's layers. It's one of those things where you have to, like, listen to an album over and over and over again, you know, and then suddenly you're like, oh, my God, there's, there's genius here. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, like, legit genius here. What was your first reaction when you read Kirby's work? Did you get it? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> I want to say no. If, if you read the, I mean, it's beautiful. It's, it's like, uh, I mean, I think the, the comparison I use is, is, like, if you listen to the Beatles and you start with the White Album, you're like, what the hell are these guys doing? Every song is different. You know, there's a lullaby here. There's a, a metal rocker here. Um, there's this huge indie, like, that, and then that was the Beatles when they just like turned off all the filters, had no editors, had the power to sort of change everything. And that's what that's what the New Gods is. It was Kirby, this guy who's he's in his uh, mid 50s at this point, and for years he's been almost literally chained to a desk doing other people's gigs. Fascinating new heroes and villains, compelling themes, and some of the most beautiful comic art you've ever seen in your life. The Fourth World sounds like a slam dunk hit, doesn't it? Except it wasn't, at least not right away. Coming up in part two, we'll examine the end of Kirby's ambitious epic and see how, years later, The Fourth World found a second life. Thanks for watching, and don't forget, Behind the Panel isn't just a video series. We have a weekly column at SciFiWire.com, as well as an audio documentary series. Be sure to listen and subscribe to Behind the Panel wherever you get your podcasts.